passionate moment you took everything that I own Everything you've given from heaven above and everything that I've ever known If you stripped away my ministry, my influence, my reputation My health, my happiness, my friends, my pride, and my expectation If you caused for me to suffer, or to suffer for the cause of the cross If the cost of my allegiance is prison and all my freedoms are lost If you take the breath from my lungs and make an end of my life If you take the most precious part of me and take my kids and my wife It would crush me, it would break me, it would suffocate and cause heartache I would taste the bitter dark providence but you would still preserve my Hello, Moon Valley. We are uh, continuing our sermon series titled Beyond Our Strength. It's a study through 2 Corinthians written by the Apostle Paul. And our study has taken us through the first part of chapter 2. And so far, uh, we've learned about the, the pain and the purposes of affliction and how to deal with hurtful people. The biblical text we're studying today um, is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In this text, we're going to learn about another important aspect of dealing with conflict and hurtful people. Our text begins in verse 5, where Paul says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely, to all of you. Now, this may sound uh, as if Paul is talking about a hypothetical situation, uh, but context makes it clear that he has a specific person in mind who has actually caused pain. And so this isn't a hypothetical situation. In the immediately preceding context, you may recall that a faction within the Corinthian church had rebelled against Paul's authority as an apostle, and they tried to uh, disparage and discredit Paul. Paul had been falsely accused of being ungodly, worldly, duplicitous, vacillating, dictatorial, and lacking the spiritual qualifications and authority to be an apostle. Um, He was also accused of being pretty bold in his letters, but pretty much a coward in person. Now, many, if not most modern scholars, believe the person Paul has in mind as causing pain was a leader of this rebellious faction. And on this assumption, Paul's point is that this leading antagonist brought pain to the entire church. Now, I don't think Paul is somehow trying to deny his own personal experience of pain. Rather, his greater concern is for the well-being of the church. And uh, we'll see that this is an overriding concern, the, the health of the church. Paul's focus is not on himself, but on the pain experienced by the entire body of Christ stemming from this one part of the body, this one man. And Paul doesn't want to overstate the damage. The pain was experienced in some measure, he says, by all, but not in full measure. He doesn't want to put it too severely. This isn't the end of the world. The sky is not falling. The church will survive. And I think this shows remarkable restraint and humility coming from someone who has full authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ, someone who has been vilified unjustly and has every right to be deeply offended by this antagonistic leader who had betrayed him. Selfishly, my temptation um, uh, would be to focus on my own pain, my own suffering, and not on the well-being of the church. My temptation would be to exaggerate the transgressions and fallout from the offender, not to downplay them. But in the middle of a painful situation, Paul refuses to selfishly focus on himself. And he refuses to exaggerate the offenses of the lead antagonist who opposed him. 
This in itself is um, impressive and unusual. Think about what a contrast this is to our current political environment. I vote for Paul. But there's more. In verse 6, Paul says, For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. You may recall from our study last Sunday that Paul had written at least four letters to the Corinthian church, two of which we have in the Bible. The third letter, which we do not have, is described by Paul as a tearful letter. It's the one where Paul confronted the Corinthians and called for their repentance. You may recall that many did indeed respond in repentance to this Uh, tearful letter. And uh, here in verse 6, Paul describes the repentant as a majority. Apparently, uh, following uh, their repentance, those in the majority turn to mete out punishment on the lead antagonist who had been causing the trouble. And the word punishment here may be a little misleading. To modern ears, it uh, can uh, sound like a a painful payment for wrongdoing, like being beaten or or stoned, but I don't think that's what Paul has in mind. The word punishment here is a translation of the Greek noun epitomia. This noun is used only here in the entire New Testament. But verbal forms of this word are used elsewhere and help us to understand what it means. For example, it is used in a quote from Jesus himself addressing his disciples in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, where he says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Here we see our word in its verbal form, epitimao, translated rebuke. It is to reprove or to to confront or to censure or to call to account. And as evident here in Luke 17.3, it is not so much making someone pay for their wrongdoing as it is calling them out, um, Uh, with a view to their repentance and uh, restoration. So back in our text in 2 Corinthians 2.6, we have a situation where the majority has turned to rebuke the lead antagonist, and they've called him out on his wrongdoing. They have declared that this disparaging divisiveness needs to stop. They have publicly expressed their strong disapproval, and in doing so, they defended Paul. Now, I want you to put yourself in Paul's sandals. Wouldn't there be a part of you that enjoys the thought of your hateful antagonist getting chastised by the majority? Wouldn't there be a part of you that that loves people coming to your defense? Wouldn't there be a part of you that would want to let this rebuke continue indefinitely so your antagonist could fully experience the consequences of his sin toward you? But in verse 6, Paul is saying, that's enough. Lay off. He has been sufficiently rebuked. No more. It seems clear the lead antagonist himself has repented. And in response to the repentance, Paul is now advocating on behalf of arguably the most hurtful person in the most hurtful church Paul has ever been a part of. That is grace. But there's more. In verse 7, he continues, So, you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I think Paul is 
following the pattern we just saw commanded by Jesus in Luke 17, 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. The rebuke has occurred, bringing repentance. Now forgive. And back in verse 7 of our text, Paul shows remarkable empathy toward his antagonist. He, He doesn't want him to be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. The original Greek word translated overwhelmed literally means to be swallowed or devoured. And the idea of being overwhelmed or uh, devoured is um, important not only for the one, but also for the many. And we'll come back to this idea in a moment. For now, in order to avoid being devoured, Paul exhorts the Corinthians to forgive and to comfort. The original Greek word for comfort is the very same word Paul used earlier in 2 Corinthians to describe God comforting us in our affliction and us, in turn, comforting others in similar afflictions. It is to come alongside, to provide help, encouragement, and companionship in the middle of affliction. And to forgive comes from the original Greek word uh, charizomai. At the root of this word is the term charis, which means grace. The idea is to give grace, to give a favor undeserved. In this case, it is to let go of the opportunity for revenge and to seek the good of another in the wake of being wrong. The antagonist does not deserve such grace. What he does does not merit forgiveness, but but, but Paul is calling for it. In verse 8, Paul goes still further. He says, so I beg you, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. And the love for which Paul is begging is not a warm feeling of affection. This agape love, uh, which is not a feeling at all, but a decision, a, a de- decision to serve the best interests of another at considerable cost to yourself. That is the kind of love that Paul is talking about. And Paul is not just asking the Corinthians to do this privately. Uh, Paul is saying that they should do this publicly. The majority rebuke the antagonist publicly, and now he's calling for public reaffirmation of love. You see, the original Greek word for reaffirm is a legal term describing a group decision in developing policy. It is to openly affirm or decide in favor of someone. It's going public with grace. And then Paul says something in verse 9 that at first blush almost seems like it doesn't quite fit here. He says, For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Now, Paul is alluding here to his third letter, the the cheerful one that called for repentance, probably repentance from the rebellion led by the antagonist. Now, among other reasons, Paul says he wrote the letter that he might learn whether the Corinthians would obey his apostolic authority or continue to obey the antagonistic leader. And of course, uh, we know that the majority did obey Paul and uh, repent. But I suspect Paul mentions it here to encourage the Corinthians to be obedient to him in everything, including his current charge to forgive, to comfort, and to love the lead offender. And Paul further encourages the Corinthians by assuring them that his forgiveness 
will accompany theirs. In verse 10, he says, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. A primary motivation for Paul's forgiveness is the well-being of the Corinthian church. He says the forgiveness is for your sake in the presence of Christ. And I think the imagery here is of Christ as the head of the church and individual members collectively in his presence. The forgiveness then is for the sake of Christ's body, the the church. And in verse 11, the last verse in our text, Paul goes on to explain an important way that forgiveness safeguards the well-being of the church. And it is perhaps not what you'd expect. He says that this forgiveness keeps the church from being outwitted by Satan. He says, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Now, this this raises questions. How might they be outwitted, and what might Satan's designs be? be in this situation? And what does all this have to do with with grace and forgiveness? Well, here's the big idea of my sermon. Here's the thing I'd like you to remember. Christians devoid of grace are devoured by Satan and divide the church. Now, let me unpack this idea because... It's important. Christians devoid of grace are those who do not give or receive grace. It goes both ways. Both the one who fails to give grace and the one who fails to receive grace are devoid of grace. And when you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are devoid of grace... We are devoured by Satan. One of Satan's designs is to devour. 1 Peter 5.8 says to believers, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, to be devoured by Satan doesn't mean that we're going to hell For those who have believed in Jesus for eternal life, heaven is secure, cannot be lost. To be devoured by Satan is to be utterly deceived by him, to be duped, to be taken advantage of. In verse 11 of our text, Paul describes it as being outwitted by Satan. And when we are outwitted by Satan, We bring division to the church, which is exactly what Satan wants. Because the work of the church is the hope of the world. The work of the church is to bring the life of Jesus Christ to the world. And that is a work that is opposed by Satan. You know, there's a lot of political talk today about a left-wing conspiracy or a right-wing conspiracy, and it's pretty heated. You know, don't be fooled. Don't fall for that. Don't be a sheep. Uh, They want to keep us down. They want to strip our rights. Take a stand. I suspect Satan is delighted with it all as long as there's no grace in it, because it's a, it's a dis- distraction, a distraction from the far bigger conspiracy we ought to be concerned about, Satan's conspiracy to outwit us. Well, what exactly does Satan do? How, how does he outwit us? 
How does he devour? Paul gives us some insight a little later in his letter. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, he says, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And so Satan disguises. The original Greek word translated disguises is uh, metaschematizo. It describes altering the outward appearance or, or scheme of things so as to deceive. He transforms outward appearances to make bad things look good. And this includes himself. Satan is in reality an angel of darkness. He is the father of lies, Scripture tells us. But he disguises himself and his ways to make it look like he's an angel of light selling sunshine. We can trace the deception all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where Satan made eating the forbidden fruit look like a really good option. And Satan's greatest work today is not in the far left. Satan's greatest work today is not in the far right. His greatest work is right in the middle, in the middle of the church. His greatest work is outwitting and devouring Christians by making bad things look good. The antagonist in our text is an example of someone devoured. We have every reason to believe he is a genuine, born-again believer headed for heaven. He's a brother in Christ. He's not an atheist bashing the Christian faith. He's a believer in the Corinthian church who bashed another believer, Paul. When the antagonist was opposing Paul, some things about this guy may have looked pretty good outwardly. God had apparently gifted him with leadership skills. Some might argue that he was just trying to leverage those skills for the good of the church, that he was able to mobilize some good Christian people behind him could be seen as admirable. He was probably convinced that he was protecting the church from the dangers of Paul. He was probably viewed as courageous, maybe even devout. If he were to be interviewed, he might say some high-sounding things about righteousness and truth and holiness. If he were to do a TV commercial, he might say, times are tough, Paul is weak, or Paul is not a man of his word. But one thing is missing. He was devoid of grace. He was not a giver of grace, which made him an easy target for Satan. Satan devoured him. Satan deceived him into thinking that what he was doing was actually good, actually righteous, actually Christianly. Satan duped him into thinking that he was a righteous defender of the church, and division resulted. The good news here is that the antagonist himself was never beyond hope. He himself was never beyond grace, and neither are we. Thankfully, the antagonist came to his senses. He repented, and I Imagine he felt profound shame for what he had done, for the hurt that he brought Paul and and to the church, for his ungracious behavior, for the ugly, unjustified personal attacks. And in light of the shame this man felt, let's look again at verse 7 of our text, where Paul says, So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Now, that word overwhelmed is a translation of the original Greek word katapino. It literally means to devour. 
And it's the exact same word Peter uses in 1 Peter 5, 8 to describe Satan seeking someone to devour, katapino. And I don't think this is a coincidence because Paul mentions the designs of Satan in the immediate context. I think Paul is now concerned about being outwitted by Satan in another way. You see, Satan can devour in manifold ways through puffed up pride or even shame-filled sorrow. Let's think about this. Some good things had happened in the Corinthian church. For one thing, the, the majority repented. That's good. Then the majority rebuked the leading antagonist. That's good too. But now they're at another point of vulnerability. If the majority does not give grace to the repentant offender, then he will be once again devoid of grace. This time, because he's not receiving the grace he desperately needs. And if the man and the majority remain devoid of grace, they will be overwhelmed. They will be devoured, outwitted, and division will result again. How so? Well, in the absence of grace given by the majority, the repentant man may be so overcome with sorrow, so swallowed by shame that he's devoured, overwhelmed, deceived into thinking that he no longer belongs in the church, that he's gone too far, that he's beyond the reach of grace. And people who feel that way generally separate themselves. Division results, and the devil delights. He sold more lies. And if the majority with, withholds grace, they too become devoid of grace because they fail to give it when it was needed, and, and they become vulnerable to being outwitted, deceived into accepting what sounds good but really isn't. Now, you better not get carried away with this whole grace thing. You know, people will take advantage. Sin will abound. It's good that we took care of that antagonist. The church is better off with those kind of bad people. We're better than him. And the devil devours and division results because the lack of grace repels everyone who desperately needs it. That's the conspiracy we should really be worried about Satan's conspiracy to get us to abandon the only thing we have going for us, God's grace. Christians devoid of grace are devoured by Satan and divide the church. There is a corollary to this big idea that is cast in a more positive way. And here it is, Christians full of grace foil Satan and fuel the church. And Paul is our example of this. I have long admired Paul for his meticulous theology of grace. If there was ever a person committed to sound doctrine, it is certainly Paul. It is largely from his writings in the New Testament that we sort out our own Christian beliefs and, and our worldview as Christians. The theme of grace in his writing is so prevalent that no one who takes the scriptures seriously can deny the importance of grace theoretically, doctrinally, theologically. Grace is probably the theological term that shows up more frequently 
in the names of Christian churches and the titles of Christian books and in the lyrics of Christian songs than any other term. But from this text, I have grown to admire in Paul something even more extraordinary, and that is the practice of grace, the application of grace to relationships, living out grace every day in the trenches of life, particularly grace in relationships that are painful and difficult. You see, talking grace is cheap. Walking grace is costly. Talking grace is easy. Walking grace is hard. Talking grace is common. Walking grace is rare. Paul advocates for his antagonist. Paul loves his leading enemy. Paul gives grace to the guy who gutted him. And in doing so, he foils Satan and he fuels the church. You know, the early church had virtually nothing going for it, if you think about it. No big money, no big buildings, no big names, no big influence, no big platform, no big endorsements. It didn't even have a Bible as we know it. There's no New Testament. It hadn't been written yet, not at first. Its leaders were not perfect, and Lord knows its people weren't either. Corinth is a, is a case in point. But all that was no big deal. The early church went viral anyway, spreading new life to the world, a world that has never been the same since, all because Christians full of grace, like Paul, foil Satan and fuel the church. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to be the embodiment of your grace in this time where there seems to be so little of it. Fill us with your grace that we may foil Satan and fuel your church in bringing life to the world. Amen. Unfortunate moment, you took everything that I own. Everything you've given from heaven above and everything that I've ever known. If you stripped away my ministry, my influence, my reputation, my health, my happiness, my friends, my pride, and my expectation. If you caused for me to suffer or to suffer for the cause of the cross, if the cost of my allegiance is prison and all my freedoms are lost. If you take the breath from my lungs and make an end of my life. If you take the most precious part of me and take my kids and my wife, it would crush me, it would break me, it would suffocate and cause heartache. I would taste a bitter dark providence, but you would still preserve my faith.